what a delight to sing songs that I trust that carry your heart and your emotions. There's something about music, particularly we sing songs like Be Thou My Vision that resonate in our hearts, that I trust that that's the longing of your heart, that Christ would be um, the center of your vision. If you're not already there, uh, please turn to the book of Psalms, Psalm 16. Thank you, Jim, for reading that to us. We're continuing on in our series through the, the book of Psalms, seeking to focus our hearts on God um, above um, all things. But before we look at the Word, let's look to the God of the Word. Lord Jesus, we humbly bow before you in, in, need, of your, in need of your great mercy, your grace. We have just sung, Thou and Thou only, first in my heart, high King of heaven, my treasure Thou art. God, that's our desire that's what we sing, that's what we pray, and, and yet we confess that we struggle so much for that to be a daily, moment-by-moment moment reality, that, that you would be first in our hearts, that you would be our, our greatest treasure. We are so easily distracted. We thank you for your immeasurable blessings, every person here, as we, each of us reflect, but may those blessings remind us of your grace and your goodness, rather than to distract us from you. God, as we're gathered together here in our church, as others are watching us on the live stream, there are weary people here, weary from struggle and suffering, weary from the burdens and difficulties of, of life, uh, weary from temptation and struggle with sin, weary with just the, the multitude of stresses and challenges that we are facing right now. And we're gathered here before you. And we need your grace, and the greatest grace that we need is that we could see you, that we could be refreshed in, in you. That we, you say in your word, Christ, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Christ, rest is in you, and, and so we come to you, each person, we, we come to you, ask that in these moments as we look to your word, as we look to your truth, that we would find rest in you, particularly by being able to see you. Open your word to us that we would be able to more consistently set you before us in our daily lives. That's our longing. That's our prayer. In your name we pray. Amen. What are you consumed with? What is it that, that drives you? When you wake up in the morning, what's the, the first thought beyond I need coffee? What's the second thought in your mind that, that comes to your mind? When you go to bed at night, what is the last thought that you think about? What is it that keeps you going through deep disappointment? When you give in to temptation, when you give in to sin, what is it that will give you hope to continue on? When circumstances are sweet, when circumstances are, are pleasant, what is the source of your thankfulness? When you're blessed with encouraging relationships and, and very thankful to the people around you, what, what is the ultimate foundation of your joy? God's Word calls David a man after God's own heart. Why? Because he was consumed with God. And this brought perspective to everything in his life. And as we go through our series on selected psalms this morning, we come to, and they're all wonderful, but this is one of the sweetest, sweetest of all God's Word, of all of the book of Psalms, Psalm 16. It's a go-to psalm. You'll see there's many verses in this psalm that we are very familiar with, and there's a reason for it. Because Psalm 16 describes a life that is focused and fixed on God. A life that it set its heart upon God. And Psalm 16 flies in the face of much of American Christianity that accepts God as part of our lives, and yet large portions of our thoughts and words and actions seem to be totally separate from Him. Psalm 16 describes a, a Christianity where everything centers around the galaxy of our lives with God at the very center. Psalm 16 pushes us to have lives and, and families and a church that is centered on God. Now one of the most encouraging things about the book of or Psalm 16 is that we know who it was written by. And we know the history of David. 
We don't know the specific history of when he wrote this particular song, but we do know the history of this man. This was a man who had deep struggles. This was a man who faced great difficulties. This was a man who who faced great temptation and and even gave in and, and had great sin. He experienced deep disappointment, deep heartache. If you read the books of particularly 2 Samuel, you will see the the difficulties and the struggles that that David went through. And so the man that wrote this did not write it from an an ivory tower walk with God. And I trust that that encourages you because if you don't keep that in the back of your mind, this will feel very theoretical. It's not. It's from a man who had deep struggles and difficulties and heartache. And what is in Psalm 16 is attainable for you. It's attainable for you if you'll press into what David writes here in Psalm 16. We will see the center point, the focus of this Psalm 16 is that we are called to seek the pleasure of the Lord's presence and you will find precious treasure. Seek the pleasure of the Lord's presence and you will find precious treasure. In this passage, we will see three perspectives of those who are seeking God as their greatest treasure. First of all, we will see that God is my good. And then God is my focus. And lastly, God is my joy. Let's look first of all at God is my good in the first verses here. I appreciate Jim. He read where it says, a miktam of David. Because that's a part, as we talked about before, that's a part of the, the inspired text. And that, little, that word miktam, it's a Hebrew word that literally means hidden. It means precious. It means golden. It even has the idea of a, a treasure that someone has discovered. And like a valuable treasure describes something that's precious and worthy of great effort, worthy of great work to search out. And in Psalm 16, David, this miktam, David re- reveals his greatest treasure, and that's the pursuit of God himself. Was David perfect? Far from it. And yet he was a man who sought God with his whole heart. In Acts 13, it speaks of David. It says, and after he had removed him, in other words, after God had removed Saul, he raised up David to be their king, concerning whom he also testified. God's talking. And God said in 1 Samuel, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart who will do all my will. Who better man to write the Psalm 16 than David? A man after God's own heart. A man who had struggles and difficulties and yet a man who experienced what it meant to have God as his greatest treasure. Let's look at that first verse. He says, Preserve me, O God, for I take refuge in you. If you know the life of David, you know he faced numerous situations where he had to make the the Lord God his refuge. Whether it was a bear, a lion, a giant Philistine, King Saul who was trying to, to kill him, he knew that he had to make God his refuge and he did that consistently. Now, if you know the history of David, did he do that perfectly? No, far from it. He struggled at times, but his default oftentimes after a struggle, was to settle back into trusting God. Is God your refuge? Where do you turn when you're faced with crisis? Where do you turn when you're faced with calamity? Where do you turn when you're faced with difficulty? Where do you turn when you're faced with personal failure, giving in to temptation and, and sin? Where do you turn? How does your response to the routine struggles of life, which sometimes are the most difficult, the routine inconveniences, the routine irritations, how does your response in those situations, how does that reveal the the focus of your heart? Do you get irritated, frustrated, angry, or do you turn to God as your focus? Beloved, we're, we're mistaken to think that we can live for ourselves most of the time And yet when trouble hits, when the crisis hits, then we presume we'll fully experience the presence of God and His strength and provision. But God wants us to walk with Him through all the the challenges and difficulties and goodness and blessings of life. David continues in verse 2. He says, I said to the Lord, he's talking to God, what what are the the Psalms? They're prayer closet. We're, We're in the prayer closet. We're with David. And he says, I said to the Lord, 
You are my Lord. I have no good besides you. Amazing statement. Beloved, do you have a a clear view of the goodness of God in all aspects of your life? In his commentary on the Psalms, Alan Ross says, quote, Without a firm conviction of the goodness of God, guilty fear will take over. Insecurities will run away with people. Prayer becomes hoping with no hope. And praise, if it exists at all, will have a hollow ring. What is needed is a constant awareness of the goodness and the grace of God. Unquote. That's what you need and I need. We need to be reminded. That's what the Psalms do. Remind us of the goodness of God. Now as you read that, you say, but, but what does David mean when he says, he says, I have no good besides you? Well, we know that David had many blessings in his life. Many situations where God intervened. God did a work. So how can David say, I, I have no good? The key phrase is, besides you. It's an issue of comparison. David is saying, God, you are so clearly my greatest good that even the best things of life fade into absolute insignificance by comparison to how good and how sweet and how precious you are. Can you say that? Like the psalmist in Psalm 73, 25, he says, Whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you, I desire Nothing on earth. It's an issue of comparison. God created us to find our desires fulfilled in Him. Because that's the central puzzle piece of life. And when the central piece of the puzzle is missing, when it's not there, then all the other puzzle pieces don't make sense. You can't figure out where they fit. And our society tries to force all kinds of other things into that central puzzle piece of life. But no matter how hard you try, nothing else will fit. Nothing else will bring true, lasting joy and satisfaction. Beloved, ask yourself, can you say that? That by comparison, by comparison, that your desire for God is so great that it's as if you have no other good besides Him. If I'm honest, I have to admit to say no. So many times I don't because there's so many times when it seems like a desire for other things crowds out a desire for God, but by God's grace, I trust it with me. You long for that. You say, I want to be like that. I want to be able to say what David prays here, that that God, you are my greatest good. And I, I have no other good in comparison besides you. Ask yourself, ultimately, what is it that satisfies you? Or what is it that you're longing to find satisfaction in so that everything else fades away into insignificance? But there are good things in life. Look at verse 3. I love how he follows it up here with verse 3 when he says, As for the saints who are in the earth, they're the majestic ones in whom is all my delight. Do you get the connection there? On the one hand, he said, I have no good besides God. And yet now in this verse... He talks about something that's incredibly good. He says, I delight in the saints of the land. They are a good thing. And when you value someone because they value God, you're not denying that God is your only good. When you value someone because of their love for God, you're expressing your love and your desire for God. So really, as you think about the relationships in your life, whether a spouse or children or friends and fellowship of the body of Christ, ultimately our delight in others should be an expression of our delight in God. And when that's the case, we will have marriages and families in a church that has a relation that can't be defined based on human terms because it's centered on the person of God. That's why there is an intangible encouragement to be with God's people. Beloved, that's why it was so painful when for several months we, we couldn't be together. We, we couldn't. And that's what David is talking about here. There's that, that love, that care that we delight in God as we have relationships with others who love Him as well. In our church, in your family, in your friendship with others in the body of, of Christ, you are tasting the goodness of God as He is blessing you with relationships that center on Him. So praise God for the fellowship of of fellow saints who love Christ above all things, and it spurs you on to love Him all the more. But this psalm has some contrasts in it. 
And there's a contrast in the next verse. Look at verse 4. He talks about those who reject the one true God. The sorrows of those who have bartered for another God will be multiplied. It's a sorrowful life to choose to follow anything but God. I shall not pour out their drink offerings of blood, nor will I take their names upon my lips. David says he, he refuses any worship of false idols. He, he, he so much refuses, he says, I won't even verbalize their names on my lips because he's so disgusted and revolted by the offense that these idols make against the one true God. But the idols of today are, are much more subtle. The idols that you and I face are much more deceptive. 19th century pastor, British pastor C.H. Spurgeon said, if you love anything better than you love God, you're an idolater. If there's anything you would not give up for God, it's your idol. If there's anything you seek with greater fervor than you seek the glory of God, that is your idol, unquote. Love it. An, an idol could be anything. It could be a possession. It could be a career. It could be a, a person. It could be a money, pleasure, getting things accomplished, being esteemed and thought well of by others, uh, not having things hanging over your head that you need to get done, whatever. There are so many things that could be idols. Be careful. Be careful about saying too quickly, well, I'm not an idolater. I don't have any shrines in my house that I'm burning incense to. No, there's something far greater here. At best, at best, all of us live on the, the fringes of idolatry with other things that, that vie for our attention against God. And we allow ourselves often to be captivated, to be controlled by, by many other things than God Himself. What is competing to be the center of your affections? What is competing to be your greatest desire and your, your greatest delight when only God deserves that place? The next verse draws a very strong contrast and shows the delight of being consumed with the one true God. Look at verse 5 to 6. He says, The Lord, Yahweh, God, is the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You support my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Indeed, my heritage is beautiful for me. D David's speaking here of, of words that talk about an, an inheritance, something that's passed on to you, a, a gift that you're given. And he is saying that, that God is my portion. God is my inheritance. Fundamentally saying God is enough. Psalm 142.5, the psalmist said there, I cried to you, O Lord, I said, you are my refuge. You are my portion or my inheritance in the land of the living. Beloved, if, if everything else in your life were to be taken away, would God be enough for you to have true joy and true delight? And, and the picture here is, is of uh, where the lines were being drawn in inheritance, where some were saying, okay, this is your inheritance. This is the land. Here are the boundaries of your land. Do you remember when God divided up the promised land between all the, each of the tribes? And each of them had specific, very specific boundaries that identified their inheritance. However, there was one tribe, there was a particular tribe that received a, a better inheritance than everyone else. Numbers 18.20 says, Then the Lord said to Aaron and the Levites, this tribe, what's their inheritance? This is in the context of everyone else is getting their inheritance. What's theirs? You shall have no inheritance in their land, nor own any portion among them. I am your portion and your inheritance among the sons of Israel. Now in our humanness, what do we say? What a bummer to be a Levite. You didn't get any land. And yet the opposite is true. You got the best inheritance because what? You got God Himself as your inheritance. What are we just sung of? Thou mine inheritance now and always. That's what this is talking about. So beloved, as we look at the implications from these first verses, do you see God as your most treasured blessing? And as believers, it's very easy for us to take other things. We are so blessed, so blessed 
but so easy for us to take other good things like, like family and, and friends and, and ministry and a, and a church and earthly blessings that, that distract us, can even distract us from God, from seeing God as our portion that we are satisfied in. How easy it is to get involved in, in relationships and, and responsibilities that God has given to us and, and possessions and work and hobbies so that God kind of becomes a, a minor afterthought in a back closet of our lives. Beloved, are you treasuring? What, beloved, what are you treasuring? What are you treasuring more than God Himself? And that's one of the reasons that, that God allows struggle, why God allows suffering, why God allows difficulty to come into our lives, why God allows failure to come into your life. It's so that you would look to Him as your greatest treasure. Do you see your most valuable blessing as God Himself? Now, does that mean you need to feel guilty because you've been blessed and immeasurably in so many other ways? No, not at all. Delight, delight in God's overwhelming blessings in your life, but let those drive you to God and give Him glory and praise Him rather than settle and stop with the blessing itself. So we see in this first section, God is my good. God is my good. And David is challenging us to seek the pleasure of the Lord's presence and you will find priceless treasure. But how do you do that? How do you do that? You say, how, how can God be my greatest treasure? Well, David tells us how. And that is God must be our focus. Look at verse 7. He says, I will bless the Lord who has counseled me. Indeed, my mind instructs me in the night. David was attuned to the Lord's voice. He listened for the Lord's voice. Psalm 63, 6 says, When I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches. I don't raise your hand, but how many of you struggle at night? You, you wake up and you just can't go back to sleep. Well, that happened to David, a man in the, God's Word. And what did he do? What did David do when he, when he couldn't sleep? When overwhelming thoughts, fears, concerns, difficulties are coming in his mind and he can't get back to sleep, what did he do? He didn't count sheep, and he was a shepherd. Didn't count sheep. He didn't think about the, the events of the day. He didn't mentally try to, to figure out problems while he was lying there awake at night that faced him as the king of Israel, and there were many. What did David do? He had a, a plan. He, had, he, was, he initiated. He was intentional. In the dark of the night, he focused his soul on God. That's what he did. The psalmist in Psalm 119, verse 48 says, My eyes anticipate the night watches. What does that mean? I look forward to when I can't sleep at night. Do you? Why? That I may meditate on your word. That's what the psalmist said. The psalmist said he looked forward to times when he couldn't do anything else. Couldn't even sleep, even though he wanted to. So that he could meditate on the word of God. And so God's Word must be the fuel. You can't just lay awake at night and just kind of on your own come up with thoughts about God. It needs to be fueled by God's truth. That means that David was very familiar with Scripture. Obviously, he wrote almost half of the Psalms. But you as well. Though you, may, you will never write a Psalm that will be in the Bible. And yet God would have you to be very familiar with His Word. Because you know it's going to happen tonight, tomorrow night, sometime this week. You'll be laying there at night. Something's going through your mind. You can't sleep. Have you prepared your heart for that? Do you have Scripture ready in your heart and mind that you can reflect on that can take your soul that's wandering all over the place and focus it on the character and goodness of God? Beloved, we must be immersed in God's Word so that we can be immersed in God. What does he say in verse 8? These 20 words are life-changing. Psalm 16, verse 8. If you and I could live what God's Word says in Psalm 16, it will transform your daily, moment-by-moment life. Consider carefully what David says here. He says, I have set the Lord continually before me. Because He is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. This is soul transforming. This is revolutionary. Beloved, this verse 
can free you from a full life that is unfulfilled. Many people have full lives, full to the seams. Our days are are filled with things to do, people to meet, projects to finish, emails to answer, calls to make, appointments to keep, things to do, tasks like stuffed suitcases. Our lives are, are bursting at the seams. It seems like we're always trying to play catch up because we have a sense of falling behind in every area of our lives. There's a nagging feeling of of unfinished tasks, of unfulfilled promises, of unrealized expectation. There's always something that we should have remembered, always something that we we should have done, or, or I should have said something more. Our lives can be very, very full, and yet, sadly, very unfulfilled. And this verse is the difference in that. This verse provides a simple but very profound solution. Practice the presence of the Lord. Practice the presence of the Lord. And it will take practice. It will take work to make this a practice because in your humanness, you will set your heart and mind on everything else. Beloved, when David says here, he sets the Lord before him, to what degree do you set the Lord before you? To what degree do you live with a a conscious awareness of the presence of God? Now, I didn't say to what degree do you live in God's presence because you do. You and I live in the presence of God whether or not we realize it. But the question that David is challenging us to is to what degree do you live with a, a vivid awareness of the presence of God? And we all have to admit This is a very deep struggle. It shows in our personal lives. It shows in our marriages. It shows in our daily activities. It shows in our parenting. It shows in our relationship. It shows in in how we approach work and, and school and all of our responsibilities. To what degree this past week? Think of the last seven days. To what degree did this past week? Let's let's just make it yesterday. 24 hours. To what degree did you live yesterday practicing? an awareness of the presence of God. Now you say, you may say, John, I want that. I want to grow in that. How can I? I There's a number of things to think about. One, a first one would be to cultivate a longing, cultivate a desire for an awareness of God's presence. A desire for that. Psalm 107 verse 9 says, For he has satisfied who? The thirsty soul and the hungry soul he has filled with what is good. So as you look at a day, that no matter how humanly fulfilling that day was, no matter how many things you got done, no matter how many things you got that you liked, that ultimately at the end of that day, it would not be fulfilling unless you were able by God's grace to practice the presence of God that you would cultivate a longing, Lord, by your grace, allow me to grow, steadily grow in practicing an awareness of your presence. A second way to grow in practicing the presence of the Lord is to fill your mind with God's truth. Psalm 119.38 says, Establish your word to your servant as that which produces reverence for you. Plain and simple. Plain and simple, God's Word is the fuel that will cause your soul to be aflamed for the presence of God. Immerse yourself in God's Word to experience His presence. Immerse yourself in God's Word, which means a third thing is that by God's grace, set aside time every day to communicate with God. Every day. 365 days a year. Leap year, 366 days a year. Every day. You say, well, that's kind of legalism. Well, let me ask you. Did you eat three meals yesterday? Well, yeah. Some more. Uh, well, that's kind of legalistic. Did you? Yeah, every day I eat three meals a day. That's not legalistic. Same with God's Word. It's not legalistic to say, if I am going to commune with God, I need to be in His Word so I can know Him. And then point your heart to God throughout your day. Beloved, point your heart to God throughout your day. This is where the rubber hits the road. It's a process to set God before you in every circumstance of life. But God in His grace, think about this past week, God in His grace gave you reminder after reminder after reminder that you needed to practice His presence. Every problem in your day is a blessed gift from the Lord to remind you to practice and consider His presence. 
Oh God, I need your wisdom. What should I do? Every person you meet is a reminder to look to God. God, how would you have me minister to this person? Every task that you need to do is a reminder to look to God. Oh God, help me to do this. Even a small task for your glory. Every interruption is an opportunity to look to God. Oh God, you have sovereignly brought into my life this interruption. Help me to have a right attitude and glorify you in this. Every conflict in your life is a reminder to look to God. God, may the fruit of your Spirit flow through me in this difficult relationship. Every sickness is an opportunity to look to God. God, may I glorify you in this. Parents, parents, Every opportunity that you have to correct a child is a reminder to look to God. Oh God, help me to correct this child as you correct me and to be able to point them to you. Parents, grandparents, all of us, every fun thing your children do that makes you smile and laugh, that's a reminder for you to look to God, to be, to be thankful. Thank you, God, for blessing my life with this child. All of us, every disappointment you face is a reminder to look to God. God, thank you that you're better to me than anything else in this life. And then after every one of those events, it's an opportunity to pray. God, thank you. Thank you for guiding me in this situation. Thank you for giving me strength in this situation. Beloved, there are no accidents. There are no interruptions in your life. Everything that happens in your life, everything that happened yesterday from the time you got up to the moment you went to bed, everything in your life was an opportunity and a reminder for you to look, to practice, to set the Lord before you. I have set the Lord before me continually because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Beloved, if you will do that, very simple, isn't that? The Christian life is super simple, but super hard. Very simple, setting the Lord continually before me. If we were able to practice that as individuals, able to practice that as families, able to practice that as a church, how different our lives would be and how centered they would be on God himself. God is my good. God is my focus. And what then will be the greatest result of setting God before you? Look at verses 9 through 11. Finally, we'll see God is my joy. Look at verse 9 to 10. Therefore, in light of all that he said about setting his heart on the Lord, therefore, my heart is glad. My glory rejoices. My flesh also will dwell securely. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, neither, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. When your life is focused on God, when you set God before you continually, there will be a pro- profound result. And what will it be? In this passage, we see there's two results. Security, you'll be secure that God is your refuge, but there's something else. It's an attitude. And it's an attitude that tells us more than anything else whether we are setting our heart upon God. And that is joy. Joy. David knew that he was absolutely secure in his relationship with God. David knew in this passage, he knew, he says that when he dies, he knows that God would not abandon his soul. David knew that when he dies and was put in that grave, God would not abandon him just to decay and that's it. Not at all. But if you know these verses, you know we read these verses somewhere else, right? Where else do we read these verses? Book of Acts. Both the Apostle Peter and the Apostle Paul quote what David says here in reference to Christ himself. Particularly in reference to Christ as the Messiah. That death would not keep him in the grave. That he would resurrect from the dead. So right in Psalm 16, we see the foundation for our relationship with God. We see the foundation for the gospel good news. That our relationship with God, the fact that we can set God before us, is based on the fact that Christ died for our sins and resurrected. He conquered death for the glory of God and for our eternal good. And so, we are absolutely secure in our relationship with God, both now and forever. And then, like a, like a magnificent fireworks display, the grand finale of Psalm 16 explodes with, with a brilliance in the last verse. Look at verse 11. You will, this is a promise, you will make known to me the path of life. And what's the path of life? It's not trying to figure out what job I should take or where I should live. What's the path of life? What is the greatest issue? In your presence. 
is fullness of joy. In your right hand, there are pleasures forever. Beloved, God created us to seek pleasure, to seek delight, to seek joy. But there's only one place that that can be satisfied, and that's in God Himself. So many people view God as somber and and glum and and just serious. And if He sees you having any fun, He's going to crush you. No, God delights in His children having joy, particularly when that joy is found in Him. Joy is a central aspect of the very character of God. 1 Chronicles 16.27 says, Splendor and majesty are before Him. Listen to this. Strength and joy are in His place. God Himself is a God of joy. And so God is a God of joy and He he beckons us. He he beckons us into His presence because when we are in His presence, it will be contagious. We will catch the joy that He has. That's why David says, in your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand, there are pleasures forever. God gives joy to those who draw near to Him. God gives joy to to those who set Him before them. And He gives us the the desire and the capacity to experience true joy in Him. Beloved, do you want to be happy? Do you want to be joyful? Do you want to have a life that's truly characterized by by delight and, and satisfaction? This psalm is the definition of that. We see in our world people pursuing that in all kinds of different ways that that never ultimately satisfy. And if you're here this morning and and that's you, the call of this passage is you you cannot set God before you until you reckon with Christ, death on the cross for you. You must come to Christ in faith and repentance so that you can experience the joy and the delight that He promises. But if you are a child of God, the call of this passage is for you is to reckon with, are there other things that are distracting my heart from pursuing joy in Christ? There may be good things, blessings. Not to turn your back on those things, but to turn your eyes on God. Because when you turn your eyes on God, everything in your life will be in its proper place. To find in Him your greatest joy, your greatest satisfaction, your greatest treasure. So David says there's three perspectives for those who God is their greatest treasure. They would say, God is my good They would say, God is my focus and God is my joy. Beloved, listen to David's call. Seek, seek the pleasure of the Lord's presence and you will find priceless, priceless treasure. On September 4th, 1622, the Spanish galleon Nuestra Señora de Atoca set sail from Havana, Cuba for Spain. And this particular ship was no typical 17th century ship because this ship was filled to the brim with a treasure of gold, silver, precious stones that the Spanish were were bringing back to their country. It was said that it took two months just to load the treasure. It was so much. But just two days into the voyage, after being struck by a massive hurricane, the Atoka sank off the Florida Keys on September 6th, 1622. It took all of its treasure to the ocean floor. Now it was a tremendous loss to, the, to Spain. And so they tried. They sent five ships, and they did everything they could to, to try and, and regain that treasure, but it was hopeless. They could not. They did not have the means at that time at all to get that. Almost 350 years later, in 1969, there was an American named Mel Fisher. He was an underwater treasure hunter, and he determined, he devoted his life, I will find that treasure. And for years and years, he and his team worked tirelessly. It was very costly. They spent hundreds of thousands of dollars, really it seemed for years, with, with no effect. Six years into the quest for the treasure, as they were seeking that treasure, Fisher's own son, Dirk, and his wife died after their boat sank because of a mechanical failure as they're looking for the, the treasure. And there are many voices that said, this is a foolish quest. Give it up. Give it up. It's hopeless. It's pointless. Even Fisher wondered at times if he should continue on, but he refused to give up. And with his team, he plotted on for 16 and a half years. And then on July 20th, 1985, the Atoka he, they finally discovered it. 
And the discovered treasure, the recovered treasure, became known as the Atoka Mother Load because it's been estimated that it's worth over $450 million. It included 40 tons, tons of gold and silver, 114,000 Spanish gold coins, silver coins, Colombian emeralds, gold, silver artifacts, 1,000 silver ingots. You say, well, how did they keep themselves going day after day when it seemed fruitless, it seemed hopeless? How did they get, get up every morning, get back on their boats to try and find the treasure? They struggled through years of seeking the treasure with a very simple but a very penetrating motto. And their motto was, today's the day. In other words, we could find it today. We could find it today, and that caused them to continue to press into it, infuse their hearts with hope. Beloved, none of you, none of us are seeking hidden, sunken treasure. But we are in a quest for an infinitely, Scripture says, an infinitely more valuable treasure to experience the unspeakable delight of knowing God, of walking with Him. No earthly treasure can compare with this treasure. And I'm sure there's times when you want to give up. This is hopeless. I, I tried to spend time in the, in the Word this morning and I was so distracted I can't even remember anything from God's Word. I tried to pray and it was as if the heavens were, were brass. I can identify, I experience those feelings like you do at times. But the call of Psalm 16 is for you to, to put away the doubt, to put aside the discouragement, to believe, believe what David and ultimately the Spirit of God declares here in Psalm 16 that, that you, you, can experience the joy of knowing God and walking with God in this life. In this life, it will be a struggle, but it's a worthwhile struggle. There's nothing else in this life that is worthy of your struggle than this. So Christian, I I challenge you, challenge you to pursue your joy wholeheartedly with abandon, but pursue your joy in God. Give yourself to the pursuit of pleasure in God because that's the only place that you will find true joy. It'll never be perfect in this life. And because of that, it should cause you to long all the more for heaven. When you, all your sin will be gone, you will. You will be face to face with Christ. There will always be room for growth, but that you would seek all the more to live today. Today could be the day when you again experience the presence of God to walk with Him. You will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is, is fullness of joy. In your right hand, there are pleasures forever. Let's pray. Talk to the Lord. How have you given in to distractions that have caused you to look at other things as more delightful, more joy producing than God Himself. Talk to the Lord now in these moments. Father, it's amazing that you beckon us into your presence, we who still struggle with sin, and yet you beckon us into your presence because of what your Son did on the cross and that we can stand before you faultless because you look at us and you see Christ. I pray for each of us here, more than anything else, that you would give us hope. I'm certain for most here they have sought you and yet it is, they have not been fully satisfied. May no one here give up thinking it's futile. May each of us be uh, refreshed with a new passion to seek you, Christ. And then for the rest of our days that we would wake up every day with a renewed passion to seek you, even though yesterday may have had failure, even though yesterday may have had difficulty, that you would refresh by your grace our passions to know you, to set you before us. We trust you for that. In your name, amen.